Well, good evening. good evening. Thank you all for coming. It is it is an honor for me to be here among you. I, I It's an honor for me to be uh, with IHMC. I have great respect for this organization. And, and I'm a little mad at you all because back when I was mayor, I was trying to get them to come to St. Pete. You all beat me on that. So <laughs> you, ought, you ought to, uh, we didn't lose too many back then. So congratulations on that. But they, uh, I did get a little bit of a consolation prize because about three weeks ago, now that I'm at USF, we came and signed an affiliation agreement with IHMC. So now our engineers and our medical folks and our marine science folks are going to at least get to work with the IHMC folks, even though we didn't quite get the operation there. So congratulations for that. It's also great to be in Ocala. I love this city. It's, it's, you know, I used to live in Brandon when I was going to college, and I would drive up to Tallahassee to go to college. And I would always try to make sure I went during the day and cut through Ocala so I could go by the horse ranches and the beautiful area that you have to live in. So uh, I congratulate you for having that. And I thank you for coming. You are here because you believe in the same thing I believe in, which is building your community. And, and I think that is so, so, so critical for all of us. You know, communities just don't develop and happen because by accident. I think some people who aren't involved think so. My wife and I have a joke, you know, because in St. Pete, we kept working hard and hard and hard, and then this would change, and we'd work hard some more, and that would change. And then people would come by and say, oh, look what just happened all of a sudden. And, and, and it, things, don't, things don't just happen all of a sudden. They happen because people like you care about the community and, and get involved and learn about what to do next and then push it to the next step. And so congratulations, your presence here means that you believe in that. I am going to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> my, well, a little bit my, about my book because my book was about building cities. I wrote a book called The Seamless City that is being uh, promoted around the country now by a group called the Manhattan Institute in New York. And it's about how you go about redeveloping cities because that's what we did. And, and, and in order to do that, what I'm going to do is give you the perspective from the mayor's job. What is the job of mayor in, in a city? St. Pete is a pretty good sized city. We have a strong mayor form of government. There are only about a half a dozen cities in Florida that have a strong mayor form of government. But what that means is that the, the, the elected mayor is both the political leader of the city and also the CEO of the city government. So he or she is responsible for hiring and firing everybody that works for the city, from police to fire to every every different department. That's a strong mayor form of government. That's what we had in St. Pete to build on. So <clears throat> I have always seen the job of mayor as being three jobs. The first job is running the business of the city. The second is dealing with the crises that come about. And, and crises are big and small. I, I always used to say some crises are uh, natural made, some are man made, and some are newspaper made. And, and <laughs> which, 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 whichever they are, you have to deal with them, right? And so, so you're, you've got a crisis just about every day, sometimes once a week, sometimes. And they're not all big, but they're, they're, they're always ones that you have to focus on. And then the third job of the mayor is to advance your vision for the city. And, and when you run for mayor, you don't run because I want to go deal with crisis. And, and you don't run because, oh, I want to deal with doing the budget. You know, you ran because you have a belief in what the city could become. And, and that, that belief needs to be articulated and then advanced. And the risk is, when you're mayor, you can get so bogged down in the business issues, which there are a lot. You have employee issues and union issues. Or you can get involved in the crises as they, and they can overtake you. And so you never get to the point of advancing your vision. So it takes a lot of discipline to make sure that while you're dealing with the business, while you're dealing with the crisis, you continually, or the organization is continually advancing your vision. So the business, running the business, <clears throat> in our case, we had uh, about a $550 million annual budget, about 3,000 employees. You have 34 departments. So you're running a a parks department and a recreation department, a police department, a fire department, sewer department, uh, sanitation department, lots of different things. You know, when I, when I took office, I was elected originally on a Tuesday, and I had five days of transition. I was sworn in on Sunday. 
And I got in there and I'm thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I, I, it, I, I've never run a city before. I called it a vertical learning curve uh, at the time. <laughs> And by the way, Mayor, I, I didn't really campaign telling people that I didn't know how to run a city. <clears throat> but when I got in, I didn't. And, and so I would come in terrified at 5 a.m. every day uh, and trying to get my arms around it and get prepared before those crises started to come that I would not be prepared for. So you, you have to deal with the business. And, and, and there are some pl things that I try to put in place, and they deal with advancing the vision as well. We, we, is, you, have to, you have to balance budgets. I had nine budgets, nine years worth of budgets. We reduced tax rates. I was very determined to do that because we had one of the higher tax rates in the state for cities our size. And so we, we, over the nine years, we reduced our real estate tax rates by 20%. Five of our nine budgets, we had real estate tax rate reductions. We reduced the size of government. We reduced from, um, from but about 10% of the staffing in the city. We did most of that through attrition. And while we were reducing the size of the government, we were increasing the number of uniformed police officers on the street. So we were, that, that was not an easy thing to do. And then we were committed to try to improve the services provided. And we did that, uh, this is all part of running the business of the city, through a program called uh, uh, the, 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 uh, of measurements, of metrics that we called the city scorecard. So everything we measured, we, we, we spent, uh, met with all the departments, parks, recreation, police, fire. How do we measure whether we're doing well? And the way this started was I asked, when I first took office, I asked somebody that was keeping track of the mayor's action line, which is the calls coming in to complain in the city. And I said, what is the number one complaint? I figured that'd be a good place to start. You know, let's try to fix the number one complaint. And they came back and they said it was for sidewalk repair. I said, okay, well, how long does it take us to fix the sidewalk? <clears throat> they didn't know. I said, well, go figure it out. So they came back to me. They said it took 30 months, <laughs> two and a half years to fix a sidewalk. And I'm a pretty bright guy. I figured, well, maybe that's the number, why it's the number one complaint, you know? <laughs> so, so, so that started a process. Now, fixing that, that problem was easy. We, 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 you know, you dedicate resources, you put a strike team together. We did a lot of things. The sidewalk repair time has been one to two weeks for the last eight years. But, but, but what, we, what, what, the issue, what really made me think was I didn't know what I didn't know. What other issues are there? What are, how are we doing on our, on, on our fixing potholes? How are we doing on our response times for 911 calls? So we started a meeting, and I met with every department in the city. And I asked them, water department, I said, are, 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 are you serving the city better this year than last year? What do you think they said? Yeah. Every department said yes. <laughs> I, I said, well, how do we know? How do we know? How do we know we're doing it better than last year? And well, that got into an interesting discussion. And what it developed was 160 performance measures that are all graph-based, and all you, you look at the past compared to the present, and so you can see if you're getting better or not getting better. And all that were relevant to me as mayor of the city and to the citizens of the city. So uh, I, my, my performance measure, so when I took office, after about four months, I, I, didn't, I wasn't getting any reports. You know, I ran a small business. I was getting reports every week. You know, I knew exactly where we were and everything. Four months. I'm supposed to be in charge. No, I, got, I, got, I did get two reports. I got the crime stats and the rainfall. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. Crime stats, rainfall. It's hard to govern a city with those two statistics alone. So I so, said, so, well, maybe I need more. And so we started to develop this scorecard. And I made a decision early on that we were going to develop easy to read graph-based measurements. We were going to put them online so that the world could see them. And then the same report that I gave to the community was going to be my report. I wasn't going to get a different report on what was going on than the community got. And so when I wanted to get my report, all I had to do was go online from wherever I was, and it would just be the same report. So in St. Pete, we started measuring how long does it take to respond to a priority one police call? 
that's pretty important if you're the one waiting for the call. It was 7.1 minutes when I took office. <laughs> the national standard is seven minutes. And we was, it was 5.8 minutes when I left office. How long does it take to respond to an EMS, emergency medical call? About four and a half minutes. How long does it take to respond to a fire call? About the same. Those are important statistics to have. How long does it take us to respond to, a, to, to, to issue a building permit? So, uh, building permits are always a, to a, a hot topic in any community, in, in, in the permitting department. And, and, and I'll, I'll get into that when I talk about economic development. But, uh, but, but that's a relevant thing. How long, how, 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 how are our schools doing? What are the grades of the public schools in the city? So anyways, we did all those measurements, we put those in place, and we, we, we ran the business of the city. So that was an important first part of the job. Second part of the job is crises. Crises come, you know, you get big ones. We had, we had a, a tanker truck hit a crash, explode on an interstate entryway into downtown. It, it, it uh, the interstate e exit, which is about three stories high, the feeder coming into downtown was on fire. The fuel had fallen over the edge and the, the city's equipment yard was underneath it and the equipment yard was on fire, and there's a drainage system, in, which I've learned about, in, in, in the interstate system from, from the feeders that go through the, the, the things that hold up the interstate, that's the technical term, and, and, and <laughs> it, 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 goes, it goes down into the sewer system, the, the stormwater sewer system. So the fuel had flowed into our stormwater sy system under the ground and was on fire. So we had fires under the ground, on the ground, above the ground, and I got there but, you know, with the fire chief at the same time, and we're walking through their explosions under the ground. And so you have crises. You've got to deal with the crises as they come. And, and you have multiple stages of the crises. You have the first stage of the crisis is chaos. Everything anybody tells you is wrong. You know, and you do. You got to be so careful because you get there, well, I think it's, and, it's, and it turns out it's later wrong. So you got to be careful on how you act when you're in response to the bad information that you're getting. And then, and, and then after you kind of, st you start to, the second phase, you start to gather the information and respond to the crises. And that goes in loops because you have multiple phases of the crisis as you're going. And then the third phase of the crisis is blame, right? Right, that's, that's, that's and the media in charge of that. And, 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 <laughs> It's, it's true, it's true. And, 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 and so, so the blame comes in two pieces. And I know there are reporters there. Please don't hate me, I'm just talking, you know. But, but the, 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 uh, uh, the, the blame comes in two parts. One, it's the blame for whatever idiot's fault this was, right? And then there's the blame for the folks that responded to it and how poorly they responded to it. So, so you got to deal with that crisis, that part of the crisis as well as you're doing it. And, and so, and I always tell folks, don't walk away from a crisis until you've gone through all three phases because you have to make sure that you do. And you have to legitimately fix whatever the situation was that caused it and also make sure you evaluate how your response was. Did you do a good job? You know? And we had crisis. We had four hurricanes in 2004 targeting downtown St. Petersburg. In, in, in one time, we, our, our emergency operations center was activated virtually the whole time. Thankfully, we got brushed. We never got a direct hit. Port Charlotte did. I spent two days in Port Charlotte with our police and fire department finding out what they did so we could go back and evaluate our emergency plan and respond to the crisis that they had. Always, use, always learn from the crises as they come. Always learn from the crisis. So you have to run the business of the city. You have to uh, respond to the crises. And then you have to um, advance your vision. In our case, of our city, we, the vision was, uh, I campaigned on a plan called the Baker Plan. It evolved into a plan called Making St. Petersburg Best. I think that cities should run with a strategic plan just like any business can run with a strategic plan. It's going to be approached differently, but I think that, I think you have to, you have to evaluate it that way. So, so the, the strategic plan for our, should always start with a mission. And our mission was, that we wanted to build the best city in America. Now, I think every city should have that as their mission, right? So when people would come to me, they'd say, well, you know, that's kind of a lofty mission. How can you tell if you're the best city in America? I, and my response was always, you know, well, okay, who's gonna follow me? 
if I say my goal is to become the fourth best city in Florida, <laughs> okay? I want to be the eighth best city in America. Well, who's, who wants to join with me and march the hill, you know, take the hill? Nobody's going to do that. You, you, you should always have a quest for excellence. If you go for excellence in whatever you do, if you go for excellence in building a city, what you find is resources will flow to you and people will surround you. And, and they will come from different directions and say, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that. I had a company, uh, the CEO of SRI. It's a lot of letters. SRI, Stanford Research Institute. They started Menlo, they, the Silicon Valley. They, the computer mouse they brought us, barcodes, voice recognition systems, high definition television. Pretty big deal, worldwide research arm. They, are, they now have a, a, they're ones that I did get. I didn't get I2, I dig it. They, are now, they now have an, a, a, a branch in, in St. Petersburg. The, the CEO will tell you, Kurt Carlson is his name, that the reason he came is because the first time we sat down with him, I told him, we're building the best city in America. What are you going to do to help us? And he said, I want to be part of that. And, 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 and if you set your goal high, people will become part of it. So that's our mission. And then under our mission, we had five strategies. One was public safety, making it safer. One, uh, a second was improving your neighborhoods. A third is, is economic development, getting more jobs and improving your economic development. A fourth was supporting public schools. Back when I ran in 2001, it was not common for the mayor to get involved in the school races because we don't run the schools and, and the school involvement. I'll talk about that, we did. And num number five, is improving services and government operations, which I've already talked about in, in running the business of the city. So public safety, we, with, with each of those categories, we, we set out how are we gonna make it safe? How are we gonna improve our neighborhoods? How are we gonna do all this? So in the public safety arena, we, we public safety in the last 10 years has taken on multiple levels. Of course, hurricanes, natural disasters, big deal. Constantly monitoring your hurricane plan building an EOC, you know, when I went down to Port Charlotte, for instance, after their hurricane, half the roof on their emergency operations center had been torn off in the midst of the hurricane. It's very hard to respond to a hurricane when that happens. So when I, I came back, I realized we did not have a rated uh, emergency operations center. So as we built our next water department administration building, I made it category five and we made that our EOC. That was the next building being built. So we, we made it category. Always work to improve your public safety arena. Homeland Security, I was mayor on 9-11. Homeland Security became a very big deal for cities. They are very scary things. You go through a lot of scenario planning of, of, of what people can do to your community. It's very scary. We, we amended our, our emergency plan that used to deal with just hurricanes to deal with hurricanes and <coughs> terrorism. And so we now have a terrorism plan as well, and we monitor it, and we're on top of it, and we work with all the federal authorities and everything else in the terrorism area as well. And then your core job of, of keeping your streets safe, very difficult job, the most important job you have. We made a lot of progress. Our murder rate, my last year in office, was the lowest it had been since they started keeping uh, FBI statistics for murder rate. Our violent crime rates came down. We added the number of police officers. We put a street crimes unit. We went after drugs. You did all the things that you need to do in a very focused effort. But I would tell you, even though the murder rate may be the lowest it's ever been, if it's one, that's too many. If, if you have one violent crime in the city, that's too many. And, and, and rightfully, people will never give you a moment of rest as mayor or police chief of a city until the crime rate is zero. And that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be because that's God, that is your number one job. Just the federal government, the, the security of our country is the number one job. For a city, protecting your city is the number one job. So we focused on it, did it. Secondary, neighborhoods, improving the neighborhoods. You know, you want it to be a nice place to live. I think more, I, I was able to attract more businesses because of the quality of life of the city than because of incentive programs. People want to be in a place that's a nice place to live. So we set out in a very strategic effort to improve all our neighborhoods. We have 110 formed neighborhood associations in the city. That's a lot. A lot of neighborhood presidents <laughs> calling on the mayor all the time to talk about issues. So we put together um, uh, with, with each of them, we, we developed neighborhood plans for the neighborhoods. And different neighborhoods are gonna have different things. There are some poorer neighborhoods 
that their big issue might be that there's people selling drugs on the street corners in the neighborhood. Well, there are other neighborhoods where there may be speeding to the neighborhood, or there are others may be just kids playing boom boxes and making so much noise. Whatever it is, you, you, you put together the plan, and it could be street uh, uh, slowing down the traffic in the community. It could be improving the, the looks of the neighborhood, and whatever it is, you signage in the neighborhood. You develop a neighborhood plan. We did that with all the neighborhood associations. So you have a, we have a neighborhood department and neighborhood folks. I would meet in my office with uh, probably every other week with about six to eight neighborhood presidents for about two hours with the police chief and neighborhood folks, and we, we just talk about the neighborhoods. What do you, what's going on? What's going on in your neighborhood? What can we do to help? So you do that. And then you have what I would call kind of bigger projects throughout the city that are helping your neighborhoods and improving the overall quality of life of the city in general. So we, we, uh, when I took office in 2000, the year before I took office, we, we, we got named on a list. You know, cities always want to be number one. We were number one mean street in the, in the country. You know, we and Tampa together. Uh, they, they put the Saint, Saint Tampa, St. Pete area, number one mean street, which means the, the least safe city in America for pedestrian safety. That's not one of those lists you want to be on. So, so we, we felt, okay, well, how do we improve that? How do we put it? So we put together, we first of all, got a, we did a study, about a, a six-month study, on, on what was happening pedestrian-wise in our city, right after I took office. And, and we identified 61 crosswalks, pedestrian crosswalks, that were not safe, that, that were the least safe in the city. We identified, of course, we had a lot of broken sidewalks. And we had some areas that needed sidewalks. And, and also that we had a lot of bicycle accidents because like most communities in America that were developed in the 50s and 60s, they were developed for cars. They were not developed for pedestrians or bicyclists. So we had to, and, and St. Pete has been a built out city for 40 years. So we, we had to go retrofit the existing city to go back and develop it into a pedestrian friendly city. So we went to those 61 unsafe uh, intersections and we, we put lights on many of them, we put, we put signage on many of them, we fixed them. We, we put a lot more sidewalks in, but we didn't do it just willy-nilly. We put it strategically. If there was a bus stop or, you, or whatever it was, wherever, wherever we thought would improve the safety the most, we put them in. We built 100 miles of new sidewalk. We also set out to build a bike path system. Now, I believe also, like becoming the best city in America, that everything you, you do should have a goal of becoming the best of something, right? So when we, we just didn't say, we're going to build a lot of bike paths. Because it's hard to get people behind that effort, right? Oh, we're going to build a lot of bike. But we set out to build the largest bike pass system in the Southeast United States. Now, why didn't I do America? Because I couldn't do it, right? Because yeah. Chicago, Portland, well, I'm not going to beat them. But I could do it in the Southeast United States because we measured what everybody else was doing. And, we, and, and, we, and it's, it's based on a percentage relationship to the amount of vehicle uh, car, car roads. Uh, so, we, so we went out. We, we, we now have, if you were to go to St. Pete now, it is the bicycle center of Florida. It is, there are bicycles everywhere. We have f about six bicycle pass systems emanating from downtown alone. We have a, a trail system that goes from downtown St. Petersburg to Tarpon Springs and is now looping around the county. It's going to come back the other way. And, and we, we named our bike system. We, we developed a bike system map that is just like a subway map. Uh, that, that's, that tells you the beginning and the ending of it. It's different color coded so the, the bicyclists can have it and they can use the bike system. It has become a bicycle mecca. And the group that named us the number one mean street in the country in 2000 invited to me to their national convention in Orlando to give the, the opening speech as the number one turnaround city in America for bicycle pedestrian safety. It's, you attack the problems and then, and then you go to make it a better place to live. We wanted, I like trees. We planted 20,000 trees when I was mayor. 6,000 of them were flowering trees. We started a flowering tree program, which we had not had one since the mid-60s in our city. So and that, they're only now getting big enough where you're starting to see them bloom all over the city. We actually put a system, the interstate goes all the way through the city, north and south. So we put a system in place. We got all the books of all the flowering trees. When do they bloom? They bloom different times of year. So we, we, we decided I wanted to have it so that no matter what time of year you drove the interstate in St. Pete, you saw flowering trees from the Howard Franklin to the Sunshine Skyway. 
And so we, we, we staggered when the trees were going to be put in in order to have the flowering trees blooming year round. We went to neighborhoods and said, if you want flowering trees in your neighborhood, pick them, we'll put them in, in the ground. And, and to, you, you want, that's a quality of life thing. Uh, playgrounds, I love playgrounds. So I had, my kids were four and five when I became mayor. And I was walking them to a playground one time, and it struck me how nice it is to be able to walk to a playground. You know, if you can get out of your house and go someplace without your car, you feel differently about it. You really do. And, and so if you can get out of your house and walk to a playground with your kids and run into neighbors at that same playground, you all of a sudden feel a little bit differently about the community, feel more, more part of a community, right? So we set out a goal to build a, a playground within a, one, within a one half mile walk of every child in the city. That was our goal. So we started by measuring. We measured where they were now. So I, I got a map in my office, I had a big map, put a dot where all the playgrounds were, put a half mile radius circle around each of those dots, and then we started filling in the white space like Pac-Man, you know, all around the city. And we wound up, when I, we, we started out with 40%, about 40%. When I left office, we were about 80%. So, so you got to the point where 80% of the kids in the city with their parents could walk to a playground. I think that's a good thing. We had a playground. I, I, I was once with my kids at, uh, in, in uh, St. Augustine. St. Augustine has got a big community build playground in their, in their, in their kind of near, near where the fort is and everything. And I went to that once and I saw a sign outside of it. And it said, this is the biggest playground in Florida. <laughs> so I measured it. And then down at Dell Holmes Park, down at Lake Megory in St. Petersburg, we now have the biggest playground of Florida. <laughs> now, I've not put a sign up to say that yet. Now, and, and our playground is to die for. It's got climbing nets, and it's got climbing walls, and water features, and everything else, and pavilions. So all, all, the, all the picnics in the city, all the church picnics, the, the birthday parties, all come to Dell Holmes Park, and they have a they have a great time doing it. But I haven't put up the sign yet, because I'm thinking if once I do that, somebody's going to measure my playground. <laughs> so, so, so what we did was, this, it's a huge park. So we built this huge playground, which is considerably bigger than St. Augustine's. And, 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 then, and then I said, you know, somebody's going to try to top me. So I started, there, there, are, there are sidewalk pathways connecting all the pavilions all over the park. And so I started putting play equipment along each pathway. So we now are we're building all this play equipment. So eventually, I'm going to be able to claim the whole park as a playground, and nobody's ever going to get bigger than us. So that's a quality of life thing. You know, if people can walk to, from their house to a playground, that means a lot. The dog parks. I love dog parks. I, 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 my, my first year of office, we started to do dog parks. And of course, the lawyers, I'm a lawyer, the lawyers all tell you, don't do dog parks. They bite people, and they bite dogs. And dog. But we did. And, and the, the, uh, the dog parks, my, I, I always like to tell this story, because my first, my first year of office, we were breaking ground on a new library. I, I, we built a lot of libraries. I like libraries. And the library, li library cost about $3 million to build. So we break ground, and we had a handful of people from the neighborhood come to it. It was a nice, small event. The next day, we cut a ribbon on a new dog park. The dog park cost $9,000. We put a fence around a lot, and we put a bench, and we put a fire hydrant, because it's, <laughs> it's cute. And, and, and we actually let each neighborhood paint the own fire hydrant. So, so that cost $9,000. We had 200 people show up for this, this <laughs> and, and thousands of dogs. And, 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 and the, they, they wore out the grass in a month, you know. And the neighborhood around them started, please build dog parks other places. You know, get these people out of my neighborhood. And, and OK, I'm thinking that this is my second, my first year of office. I'm thinking, OK, uh, they're cheap. Everybody loves them. I would like to get reelected. I'm going to build a lot of dog parks. So <laughs> if you come to St. Pete now, there are dog parks all over the city. Now, it's a quality of life thing. People, people like that. It, it, it improves. So we, we have skateboard parks. We put two, two water slides at each swimming pool in the city, two big, big ones. And they, uh, the attendance at our swimming pools went up by 40% in one summer. 
by doing that. So, so you, you improve the quality of life, and all of a sudden, people want to come become part of it. So neighborhoods, work on your neighborhoods. Public safety, neighborhoods, schools. We had uh, a number of school programs in the city. And, and my thought was, I don't want to try to run the schools, and I don't want to get the school folks mad at me. So we, we came up with a lot of programs to try to help our school system. But before we did any of them, I would sit down with the superintendent of schools, and I would say, this is what I'm thinking about doing. If you don't want me to do it, I won't do it. And if you think it's a good idea, we will do it. That's a pretty disarming thing. And so virtually every time they said, yeah, yeah, we'd like you to help. So for instance, we have something called doorways scholarships. A doorway scholarship tells a child that's in sixth grade who's in a free and reduced lunch program. And, and, and it's very hard to get the statistics on what the graduation rate on kids in free and reduced lunch programs, but it's not high. It's probably under 50%. So it tells, tells those children in sixth grade, if you will do certain things, maintain at least a C, stay crime free and drug free, attendance good, conduct is good, between sixth grade and 12th grade. When you get to 12th grade, we'll give you a four year college scholarship. That's a very good incentive to stay good for that period of time. So, so we, would, we, we wound up raising private money, these were all privately raised, and I worked with the local education foundation, and, and I'm, I'm, I've lost the numbers out of my mind right now, but let's just say it cost $15,000 to buy a prepaid tuition scholarship for a sixth grader for, for, for when they eventually get to college, okay? Well, we, there's a program in the state called SAVE that if you're doing it for a child in a free and reduced lunch program, they'll match it. So it's 7,500, 7,500. And then I went to the local foundation and said, okay, if I get, if I raise 3750, I shouldn't have started with 15. Let me start with 16, okay? Eight, and now if I raise four, will you give me four? And, and they said, the local Pinellas County Education Foundation, which is all business folks in the community, said yes. So then I went to a businessman I know, and I said, if I raise two, will you give me two? So he said yes. And so all I, then I could go to anybody in this room, and I'd say, how would you like to send a kid to college in a free and reduced lunch program that's, that probably doesn't have a chance otherwise? So for $2,000, you could do that. Then you, then, so I went around and got you people to give me $2,000. And then I leveraged it to four, to eight, and to 16, and I was able to buy a prepaid tuition scholarship. We, had, we gave away 1,000 of those while I was mayor. And the kids who went through that program, now I, got, I, was, I was in office long enough where I had two or three classes done by the time I, I got out of uh, office. And, and those classes, 93% of the kids graduated from high school and went to college. It's an amazing statistic. And, and what kind of impact does that have throughout the system? So we did school programs. We did corporate partnerships. I, think, I, I happen to think a lot of the public schools are, feel isolated from the community. They don't, if they need resources, they don't know where to go to get them. And so, a lot, and, and it really struck me, I was walking through a school, with an uh, elementary school in St. Pete, with the principal. And the grass was high. And I said, well, why is the grass so high? Kids are out playing, why is the grass so high? And she said, well, you only get certain number of cycles of, of cuts a year. And during the rainy season, it grew faster. And so we did. she said, I actually have somebody that could cut the grass, but we don't have a lawnmower. And I remember thinking, I came out of the business community. How many businesses, if they knew that that school needed a lawnmower, on Saturday would go to Home Depot and get a lawnmower for that school? And it made me start to think, what we need to do is connect our businesses with our schools. So we, I started to recruit corporate partners for our schools. And, that, and the corporate partners could provide mentors from employee base, mentors and, and uh, tutors and volunteers. They could provide strategic help and in some cases money. And, and when I left office, we had 100 corporate partners. So every public school in the city had at least one, many had more than one, and they, and they did all the things to try to help we had teacher loan programs. We used state housing money to provide teachers with loans to use as a down payment on a house. I believe the amount was $20,000 so that a teacher could get a $20,000 loan using state housing money if they taught in the city in the urban center and if they lived in the city. And they could use that towards a down payment on buying a house. 
It was an interest-free loan. And if they taught in the city, I think for seven years, they never had to pay the loan back. That was a great incentive to get teachers to stay in the urban core and to teach in the urban center. And we, 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 we did dozens and dozens of those, of those loans over that course of time. So you, you work on programs to try to, we, have, we had a program called the Top Apple Program, where if you know, schools are now graded A, B, C, D, F, based on their standardized test scores and such, and, and if, they go, if they're bad, we all complain about it. But if they go really well, what do we do? What do we do? So we decided to put together the Mayor's Top Apple Program, that if a school either increased a letter grade or maintained an A, that they became a Mayor's Top Apple School. And we did things for the assistant principal and the principals. So the principal would get, that we'd have a big ceremony at City Council, the legislature would come and everything, and the principal would get a big banner, like a Final Four banner that they would hang in front of the school. And if you go to the city right now, and you drive around the city, you will see these banners in front of the schools. 2007 Mayor's Top Apple Award. They would get a, a gift basket. They would get a marble apple with their name engraved on it. They would get dinner for two at the Columbia Restaurant, downtown St. Pete at the pier. They would get a weekend at the Tradewood Resort with their family. And they would get a $2,500 cash bonus all privately donated to, to go to the, to the principals. A great incentive for principals to stay, again, in the urban school. Sometimes it's hard to keep them in the urban centers as, as opposed to going out to the suburbs. So we did a lot. Our schools had great success because of the combined efforts of our teachers and our principals and our administrators and everybody involved in the school system. And we went from having zero A elementary schools out of 27 in 2001 to 16 A elementary schools in, in 2009. And we increased the number of A and B schools by 260%. The bottom line is, is with, with the partnerships and by working together with the entire community, bringing, becoming part of the public schools, you can make a lot of progress that we did. Finally, economic development was the last part of making St. Petersburg's strategic plan best. Downtown, what we call Midtown, and then jobs in general. Downtown St. Pete, for those of you who have not been there recently, in, 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 in my humble opinion, is, is I think the most vibrant nighttime downtown in Florida. If you were to go downtown, Beach Drive, Janus Landing, uh, we'll, we'll go through the McNulty areas. You go on a Friday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday night, there's activity all over the downtown. Very vibrant, never used to be that way. And, and, it, and it, the lots of effort, that's, a, that's an hour long discussion in itself, but there's a very focused effort. Part of, a big part of that focus was events. We brought the Honda Grand Prix of St. Petersburg, IndyCar race into downtown St. Pete, 150,000 people a year come to it now, drive it on the streets of downtown. It's televised in 200 countries around the world. Big deal for us. We have running events. We have the Blues Festival. And, the, and each one of our major festivals downtown draw about 25,000 people a night for three nights, 20 to 25 a night for three nights. Very, very big activity center. And then culture was a big part of it also. Uh, we brought uh, the Dale Shahuli Glass Collection to downtown St. Pete. We put together a project to move and build a, a big Dali Museum. If you haven't been to the Dali Museum, the new one in downtown, you need to go. It's, they're drawing four to 500,000 people a year uh, into that museum, and it's become a great center. Expansion of the Fine Arts Museum, Florida Orchestra come down, a real focus on making it a cultural center uh, in the city, which I think it's become as well. And again, we claim to be the cultural center of Florida and you, you, because we, we're, we're going to claim that, and so, uh, and, and, and and I can give you all sorts of statistics and magazines that'll back me up on that. Uh, so so, but culture was a big part of the downtown. So so the effort. Oh, uh, um, job recruitment. I talked a little bit about very very active in job recruitment, and then Midtown. I'll close with Midtown. Midtown, uh, poorest part of our community. It was the uh, the highest crime rates. Uh, lots of urban decay, and became the, f the main focus of my first four years of office. So we focused on everything at one time, hence Seamless. You, 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 you don't just start with one place. And the whole idea between Seamless City, the name of the book, was, was that you should never have a place, there should not be places in your city where you cross a seam. And whether that seam is a, a road or a neighborhood boundary or a railroad track, 
and enter a place where you don't want to be, where you feel like you've got to reach over and lock your door, or you see broken windows everywhere and boarded up buildings. Cities should not have that. You know, we, we've, we, we almost accept that now. We shouldn't. Uh, we, we should work towards making it so it's seamless, so that every place is not going to be the same. Some people will live in apartments and duplexes, and some will have mansions on the water. But, that, but, but they all should be safe. And none of them should have prostitutes walk in the neighborhoods or drug dealers on the street corners. And, and, and children should be able to grow up safe and grow up feeling safe about their environment. So in order to do that, we had to focus a, a considered effort into the midtown community of St. Petersburg. And, and it's hard to describe without taking you on a tour of midtown the type of progress that we made. But I, but I will tell you, it's one of, the, one of the best turnarounds of any part of a city like that in America in the last 10 years. And, and, and I, I can tell you that, and I could go through all the projects with you, or I could tell you how I, I, I think I could convince you. I am a, an, an admitted Jeb Bush Republican, conservative. When I ran the first time, in, and, and by the way, St. Petersburg is 29% Republican in the city. When I ran the first time, I, in the Midtown communities, the precincts in the Midtown area were won by the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. Okay? I did not win those precincts. When I ran for re-election four years later, I ran against the chairman of the Democratic Party for Pinellas County. And I won 90% vote in the Midtown precincts. So you have to ask yourself, do the people in Midtown think that we turned that part of our community around? And I will tell you, we absolutely did. You can walk there, you, you can see a new clinic where the old black hospital used to be that had been closed for 35 years and was falling down. You can see the old Jordan School that is now a, 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 a Head Start program and is rebuilt. It literally was flooded in the basement and falling down. You can see the Jordan School was a black school during segregation. The Mercy Hospital was the black hospital during segregation. The Royal Theater was the black theater that had been closed as a theater for years and is now a vibrant boys and girls club. We got Sweet Bay to put a grocery store in the heart. We have retail throughout this part of the community. We got the post office. If somebody wants to ask me about the post office, an incredible story. I literally had to go to the White House to get a post office retail center in, in, in Midtown, St. Petersburg. We turned that part of our community and we made it a seamless part of our city going forward. So, I talked real fast, talked longer than I should, but I left some time for questions. So I'd like to thank you again for having me. I appreciate it all. Yes, sir. Where are all those drug dealers and prostitutes now? Well, I don't think you can assume that that it's, 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 you're just pushing them from place to place. Uh, I'll give you an example where some of the prostitutes are. Most politicians seem to do that. Well, it, I, it's, 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 I think most of them are trying to fix things. I, I, I think that, let me talk, talk about prostitutes for a second. We had built, one of our programs was to build a drug rehab center in the Midtown area because a lot of the folks on drugs are, are, are addicted and unless you can get them off of the addiction, you're not going to get them back into jobs. So you have to put them through, through both a drug addiction program and a job training program. And actually, Governor Bush, my first, second day in office, flew to Tallahassee. He helped me get the funding for the operations as this drug rehab center. After I'd been in office for a while, and, and you're right, you go, you arrest the prostitutes. <coughs> they, they may make it to the jail and then back out the next day, and it's a cycle. But when you talk to the police officers, they will tell you that 100% of them are addicted to drugs. Very hard to get them out of that lifestyle if, if, when, when they're addicted to drugs. So I, I lobbied Tallahassee, and we got a 20-bed female drug rehabilitation component, residential component, as part of our drug rehab center so we could target the, 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 the women that were in prostitution and others and get them through drug rehabilitation into an alternative job and drug training, job training, so they have an alternative to doing that. And, 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 and you're right, some, some will just move to another place that's not enforcing it as much. But uh, I think that is, as a city, you've got to focus on getting it out of your community. And try to solve the problem. It's a hard problem to solve, drugs. Yes. Uh, okay, well, you and then you. 
Um, I grew up in Miami in the 50s and the 60s. Fort Lauderdale was a very small little tiny town. And the only reason we left Miami to go to Fort Lauderdale was because we saw a movie that said where the girls are. That was the only reason to go up there. But Fort Lauderdale decided who they wanted to be. Hotels and resorts and the financial district and you know manufacturing and so on. I feel that cities have to say that somewhere along the way, the way this is who we want to be before they can say we want to be the best. What are some of those things that you you look for or you have to identify to say to Ocala, this is who we want to be, and who says those things to, to get this ball rolling to be the best city? Um, the, the, uh, that's a great question, great question. I think um, you first, uh, my recommendation, I, I, I wouldn't presume to try to tell Ocala what, what, what would be best for them, but I think the first part of any city is to inventory what your strengths are now. What is, it that, what, is, what is it that you're known for that is a positive thing? What, is, what are your strengths? And I, when I think of Ocala, I think of uh, horse ranches and, and, and the fact that you've got the national forest right here that, that you could somehow tie to. I think of the location, the proximity that you have uh, within the universities. The major, that's why I, one of the reasons I think IHMC is here is because you can get to, to UCF, USF, Gainesville real quick. And so, so you identify what you, you have what are your strengths, and how can you build on the strengths that you have? It's really hard to build something out of nothing. So you, 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 you're, it's much easier to say, well, this is what we have now. If we could, maybe based on that, we can improve in this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction. St. Pete, I'll give you a great example. Downtown St. Pete. We, had, uh, we have a beautiful waterfront park right on the bay, and nothing going on, right? Nothing going on. And I, and, and I thought, well, you know, we have, uh, we have the potential for this beautiful European boulevard that we've never had. So as we started build, as condos started to be built, we were working with the, the developers. We required each of them on Beach Drive to put a plaza out front, to put their parking in the inside, so, and, 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 not, and put the towers in the back, and then put sidewalk cafes at each of these plazas. And if you were to go downtown St. Pete now, you'd find that the core of our downtown redevelopment has been the Sidewalk Cafe Boulevard on Beach Drive. That was our strength. Not everybody's on the park system on the water. So that other people have other strengths. But you start with whatever your strengths are, and then you build for it. As far as who should do it, I think it, I think the mayor's a good idea. Excuse me, mayor. <laughs> but I also think the chamber, I don't know what the chamber, the chamber in St. Pete, was really a, the, the driving force of St. Petersburg for the 80s and 90s. And, 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 and the business community, the chamber community, that was a big part of it. Uh, but, but neighborhoods, neighbor, neighborhood leadership, I and mean, we had four neighborhoods. So there's, there's a lots of folks that pr participate. Somebody's got to kind of bring them all together. That's usually the political leadership. Yes, in the white, in the white jacket, the lady in the white jacket here. Well, you, you described doing a lot of infrastructure and uh, parks and uh, paving and uh, and then you said that you reduce the taxes. So how did you pay for it? Sure, that's that's always, that's usually the first question. The the the, um, the the one one of the answers is uh, that we have a half cent sales tax that can go to capital infrastructure. And it's actually a cent, but the county keeps a half cent, so, so we get to half cent, and, and about. Now, some communities have, the, a lot of communities have that, and, and it's what, what do you do with it? And, and, and a lot of communities, it all gets sucked up into large athletic facilities and you know, arenas and stuff like that. Um, we didn't really do that during my term, at least. We, we, we tried to focus that on, on all those things that I was talking about. The second part of it is, is you, you need to have partnerships. There are not enough resources to do everything you want to do. We couldn't have done the schools without the corporate community. I didn't put a dime of city money in it. And I, had, I, I did have an administrator in charge of it. But as far as, other than her salary, we didn't put money into the school programs, but we had a tremendous impact because of all the partners that we brought in. We, we uh, a great example is a library. The, we wanted to build a library on the west side of town. The west side of St. Petersburg was a, 
higher higher income levels and 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 always felt that it had not been served well by the city. And they had an expression that we exist to pay property taxes for the city to spend in other places. That was always their, their feeling, and, and for some good reason. And so we tried to, we focused some programs on everywhere, seamless, but there too. And one of the things was, was we set out to build a new library on the west side of the city. We had an old library that was actually attached to the back of a middle school library. Very small library. Not not very well used by the community, and uh, so I met with the president of the St. Petersburg College, Carl Culler, and we put together a partnership to build a new library on the St. Petersburg College campus on the west side of the city, that would be used both by the college and by the city, and it could and and, and of course, lots of people against it. Anything you do, lots of people will be against, and, and so so you have to work your way through. And then and, and I can give you all the reasons, but they, they had plenty of reasons that they were against it. But at the end of the day, we spent $2 million of city capital money to build an $11 million library. We got the college put money in. We got state grants to put money in because they have matching library grant funds. And then I took the money that I was spending on the small library behind the middle school. I took that budget, and I committed to give it to the college for them to, to operate the, the library. And then they froze that amount for three years. And then they could only increase it by the increased cost of staff. So I spent no more operating expenses. I got a library that was 50,000 square feet as opposed to about 8,000 square feet. It had a 10,000 square foot children's area in it. It had a coffee shop inside the library. It had 17 times the number of computers. And we didn't spend a lot of city money. I, I could go on. We, our our, our, uh, our Terminal, our airport terminal, in, for our we have a downtown General Aviation Airport. That airport terminal costs four million dollars. We spent four hundred thousand dollars of city money to do it. So there's, and I could. That's another long story. But it's, but you, you leverage, you, you find partnerships, you work together with folks, and you, and and we had the, the petty sales tax. We have time for one more question. Oh, I can't. Okay, I'm going You and you. That's my last one question. Here. I'm a politician. I can't. You know, I mean. Yes, and, and him in the brown shirt. Over there. Thank you for the, your talk. And if, if you were in office now, one of the crises you would be dealing with is uh, jobs, both as mayor, how to hold on to the public jobs and how to encourage more private ones. And I wondered, beyond the question of long-term ec economic growth, what do you think cities could do right now to help out in the, in the jobs question? Well, I think I think you have to relate it to the long-term economic growth. It, it's it's uh, and by the way, I was mayor for the la for the first two years of the recession. So uh, we we had some pretty tough budgets to start out with, and and uh, and and the same sort of jobs issue. Um, I think you have to be very aggressive. I think a city should have an economic development plan. Number one is your permitting department should work. That's very important. Many do not. And if your permitting department doesn't work, so it, when people come in, they can get a permit easy, and they and and it's I mean they have to follow the rules, but but it's 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 not dysfunctional. Ours was dysfunctional when I took office. It took three four years to get it to the point where we were satisfied with it. That has to work because you have to, you have to you have to be a place where people want to come and do business. So if your permitting department doesn't work, they're not going to do it. If your tax rates are too high, they're not going to want to do it. So and, and you can you can provide in, incentives and there's state incentives and county incentives, but you have to I think first again start with the businesses you have, work with them. I visited businesses all the time. I'd go down and I'd sit down with the business leaders. I'd sit down with the officers of a particular company. And we have a lot of big ones in St. Pete. And I would say, number one, how, uh, tell me all the things that we're doing right, the city. Now, I always start with that, because when you get to the other, it takes a long time. So, and, then, and then I say, OK, tell us what we're doing wrong. And then, and then make a list to make sure you're responding to it. And then, what can I do to help you grow in our city? What can I do? And, and I, of course, even before I do that, you start off by saying, thank you for providing jobs in our community. So, so support the businesses you have so they don't leave. Find out if they're about to leave and find out why and find out what you can do to stop them. And then work on recruiting other businesses. And I happen to believe heavily in the technology areas. Tying, tying companies to, to a group like this is very important. We do it with the universities in the community. The research going on, the, we just brought a large pharmaceutical, not a, a pharmaceutical 
developer into St. Petersburg a couple weeks ago. You, you by tying it to the university, so you, you you do you do all those things, but you should have you should have an economic and jobs plan as part of the city. It should it should and we we had one. Last question. Uh, St. Petersburg and Tampa Bay are very close. They're kind of like Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, recently, the St. Petersburg Times becomes the Tampa Bay Times. How does St. Petersburg keep its identity from Tampa Bay? I think that was a horrible decision, and I say that in all honesty. I think it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, they took a, a, a newspaper that was built and grown for 110 years in a city, and, and they didn't just name it after a region. They named it after another city because nobody outside of the editorial board of the St. Pete Times really thinks of Tampa Bay being anything other than Tampa. I mean, you just said Tampa Bay meaning Tampa, and, and, and that's what other, other people think too. So what they've done is they've named St. Petersburg's newspaper after Tampa. It's a horrible decision. You just have to work on whatever you can, like the Honda Grand Prix of St. Petersburg to brand the city. You just do whatever you can to continue to brand your city the best you can. But that's going to be one that's going to be hard for the city to recover from for some time. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you so much for having me.